Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, and this is Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach of the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. This show is based on my books, Beyond the Lines and Beyond the Game, and it's about leadership, character, and creating a superior culture of excellence. My special guest today was born with four impaired limbs, and he will inspire you because he has inspired countless people throughout the world. And Sports Illustrated named him one of the most accomplished, physically challenged athletes in history. He is the one and only Roger Crawford. And today, we are going beyond your potential. Hey, Roger, welcome to Beyond the Lines. Thank you so much, Rusty. It's really a pleasure to be here. And congratulations uh, with all your success as a tennis coach. That's quite impressive, 22 years so uh, uh, in winning championships. So I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, Roger, I am super excited to have you. You are someone that inspires me now as well. And Thanks. I want to ask you if you can first um, share with us in detail about the condition that you were born with. Right. So Rusty, I was born with a physical challenge. It affects all four of my limbs from the elbows down and, and from the knees down. So I have uh, two fingers on my left hand and, and one finger on my right hand. Um, you know, it's interesting. My, my grandchildren are just fascinated by the fact that I have a college degree, but I'm unable to count on my fingers. They don't understand how that worked, you know, <laughs> how I was able to have a college degree. But uh, uh, my bottom part of my left leg was amputated when I was five years old. And today I wore an artificial leg or a prosthesis and I had three toes on my right foot partially developed lower right leg. You know, but Rusty, I was fortunate growing up that I had a mother and father that instilled in me that I wasn't gonna use this as an excuse. They always said, you know, you gotta do the best you can with what you have. And it, it helped me understand that, you know, we're all challenged in some way. You know, some challenges you can see like mine, but there's also challenges that you're unable to see. So I think growing up with that mindset, it enabled me to not fall into self-pity to be determined and become the best version of myself. Roger, you know, for my coaching, you know, with a lot of my students, the, the parents, I would tell them, the parents, that I'm not gonna protect your child from a challenge. I'm gonna teach them how to face it. Right. And I'm so happy to hear that's what, that's what your parents did. Absolutely, and I think one of the great gifts that we can give others is facing adversity, not trying to protect them, not shielding them from challenges. Because what happens is as we walk through it, we become more aware of our own capacity, um, our courage, our resiliency. And so I think that's really a great gift. And for the people listening, I'd ask them to look back at their lives and some of the adversity they've been through. And I'm sure that they could point to tremendous benefits that they've realized because of it. So um, I, I think you're very wise as a coach, Rusty, and as a leader that you place people in positions where they have to discover their courage. Yeah, no, that's because challenges, it's inevitable. We're, we're all going to have it. And, and some of us will deal with deeper levels than others. But Roger, I feel I, I, it's so amazing that you picked up the game of tennis and you excelled in tennis through high school. And then you went to college. You played college division one tennis for Loyola Marymount University. Why did you have such a passion to really start and to pursue tennis? So Rusty, I, I, I come from a, uh, an athletic family. My father was an athlete as well as my brother. So, so I really loved sports growing up. I think for me, sports were so important because they gave me a platform that helped me feel equal. You know, if I could go out and participate on the football field with the other kids or the baseball field or whatever, just participating, you know, I felt like I was, I was equal, right? I, I didn't have a physical challenge. 
But I fell in love with tennis. We moved to California from Ohio, and there was this uh, tennis court, uh, public courts across the street from our house, and there was this backboard. And I just became fascinated with the sport. Um, I, I would take the racket, lay it against my right arm, and then hold the grip to my right elbow with my left hand. So that's how I began playing tennis. But I fell in love with the sport. I think uh, part of my um, uh, being attracted to it was the fact that it was an individual sport. I could do it on my own. And um, I just I just loved the whole, I just loved everything about the game. So that's how I got started. Yeah, no, that I like hearing that. And, you know, when I started, I, I did baseball, then soccer. And when I started tennis, I thought to myself, all I got to do is hit the ball in one more time. I can do that. And, and that's something you thought about, right? Absolutely. You know, Rusty, I think you really hit on really something key. And that was that, you know, I realized, you know, obviously I'm not going to be the fastest. I'm not going to be the most powerful. But, but what I found was that if you could keep the ball coming back over the net one more time than the other person, you win the point, as you said. So it really speaks to, I think, an important principle in all of our lives, and that is that consistency is more important than perfection. It's continuing to hit that ball over the net. And I see, I apply that in my own life and my work as well. You know, perfection, striving for to be perfect can, can really be a demotivator because very rarely, if ever, do we reach perfection. I don't think we're called to be perfect. I think we're called to, to be better. And that's why I just think having that consistent mindset, just every single day, putting in what it takes, you know, the work before the work. And um, so, yeah, so consistency was was a huge part of me having whatever success I had, you know, as a tennis player. Also, I got to tell you, Rusty, that, um, you know, my physical challenge in some ways worked to my advantage because, you know, as being a collegiate athlete, when somebody walked out and realized I was going to be their opponent, they started to get some butterflies because a couple things happened. Number one, they thought, what if I lose to this dude? Right. How am I going to explain this to my teammates, to my friends? I lost to some guy, you know, with three fingers and one leg. So that kind of, that kind of worked to my advantage. And then, you know, the more consistent I could be giving them more chances to miss. <laughs> that also made them a little bit nervous. Roger, I'm sure you have so many stories where people just cannot believe they lost to you. But, you know, that's that's the heart. I mean, you have a heart of a champion. And I love that. And I, I noticed that on, on your rackets, there's like in the throat area, there's a, a contraption that allows you to hold the racket. Can you can you tell me about that? Yes, yeah, so I'm glad you brought that up. Let me tell you where that that device came from. When I was 13 years of age, I walked into a tennis store and I saw what I think is the holy grail of tennis rackets, the Wilson T2000. Rusty, you're probably not old enough to remember the Wilson <laughs> T2000, but it had two parallel bars that were open from the head of the racket to the grip. My finger, this finger got stuck in between the two parallel bars. So oftentimes people will give me way too much credit. They'll say, Roger, that was so innovative. I mean, how you, how you learned how to hold the racket? I said, not really. And my finger just got stuck. So that's how I, so that's how I secured it. And from that, I used Wilson T2000 for years and years. And then finally, when some of the, the, the newer rackets came out, I was able to take that same space, those same dimensions, and put it into a, a racket today. And so I still use Wilson rackets. They've been really great to me over the years. And so I just have that piece that has the same dimensions, put my finger in, just keep, that's how I hit the ball. Wow, that that is that is absolutely amazing, Roger. I mean, and, you know, for me as a tennis player, I... I don't think I could be able to do what you do like that as well. So that that's tremendous. But I want to ask you, Roger, you know, people learn so many life lessons through sports. And Absolutely. you mentioned consistency earlier. What, what are some life lessons that you learned through playing tennis? Mm, so many. Um, being able to take risks. You know, it's fascinating. And I, I'm sure that you've shared this with your students is, is oftentimes people think, you know, to win a match, 
uh, it's important that I don't miss any shots. Well, the truth is to play at your best, you got to miss a few shots. You have to take a few risks. So what that taught me was wherever there's opportunity, there's always a risk. You know, some people look at that and say, no, 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 I'm not going to take that risk, you know, because I'm afraid of failing. The people that achieve their very best look at a situation like that and say, well, if I didn't take this risk, what opportunity might I miss? So I think opportunity and risk is huge. Certainly preparation, right? Um, you know, I, I always say to people when they, they, they say, well, I'm going into, you know, maybe it's a sales call or whatever, and I'm nervous. I say, you know, you want to reduce your nerves, prepare more. The more you prepare, the more that your mindset is going to be, you know what? I'm capable. You're aware of your capacity, your resiliency, and you're ready to move forward. Um, follow through. You know, that's another one, right? I mean, it's so important that you, you know, you complete your stroke. Well, for people listening, they can all point to areas of their life where they see that value, right? A follow through. It's not just preparation, eye on the ball. You got to finish the stroke. No matter what you do, follow through is absolutely crucial. So that would just be a few. I mean, there's so many, right, that you can take from the game of tennis. And I think really any sport. Yeah, I, I love hearing your insights, Roger. And and you were a frequent guest on the Tennis Channel. I mean, I, I love seeing your segments on the Tennis Channel. And what do you feel? I mean, you've shared already some incredible things, but what is your big message to the world? Well, I would think that the most important message that I could share with audiences is that, and you said something similar earlier, Rusty, and that's challenges in life are inevitable, but defeat is optional. Uh, I, I want to provide to audiences and to people um, some ideas on mindset, reminding their, them of their own power, their own ability to achieve their very, very best. Because oftentimes in life, we underestimate ourselves and we overestimate our obstacles. So I think sharing those messages of mindset, because, you know, the better that we choose to think, the better results we get. You know, yeah, we, mindset. we talked earlier before the interview about self-imposed limitations. And, and have you noticed that you very rarely, if ever, perform better than you believe you can? You know, when, when you believe that you can't do something, you work really hard at proving yourself right. In the same respect, when you believe that you can do something, you're going to work really hard at proving yourself right. Now, it's not just thinking about it. It's doing something about it. But I, I really believe that mindset is the foundation for, for success because we can often sabotage ourselves with, with our thinking, right? And, and I know for me, I've often said this, I, you know, I'd rather have the physical challenge I have and a positive mindset then be able-bodied with a negative mindset. Because I gotta tell you, I think that a negative mindset is a lot more disabling than my hands or my legs. Now, as I mentioned, it's not the only thing that you need for success, but I do believe it's the most important thing. And, and I, when I look at success, it is, to me, it's becoming the best version of ourselves. You know, I, I've accepted that no matter how much I practice, I'm never gonna be the best Roger in tennis. It ain't gonna happen. So when we think about becoming the best version of ourselves, we have to redefine what winning means. And I think what winning means is becoming your very, very best and the competition being you, just trying to be a little bit better every single day. That's what I think about success. I, I love hearing that. And I love that you, you, you talk about mindset so much. And I, I do the same because the brain controls the body. And Absolutely. Roger, you're, you're an author of multiple books. And I love in your books how you talk about how so much things are imagined versus real. And nowadays, there's, there's a big thing about mental health. Absolutely. What are your thoughts about mental health issues? Well, I think it's important 
and and again, I, I press this by saying, you know, I'm I'm I, I I haven't studied mental health, and and I always say to people, you know, when they're in, you know, having bouts of depression, they need to 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 seek out a professional to address that. But I think in just looking at it in global terms, I think it's important that you separate fear from anxiety. Here's what I mean: fear is based upon something real. Fear is present-based. Anxiety is future-focused. And anxiety is believing that something's going to happen in the future, whether it occurs or not. It's anticipating a negative event. What's interesting about anxiety is it doesn't have to be based upon something real. It just created your imagination. It's often defined as the negative use of mental rehearsal. Here's why I bring that up, Rusty. I think that for a lot of people, we get caught in this cycle of, anxiety. And we are looking in the future and we're pro projecting all these negative outcomes that happen. What does that do? That paralyzes us in the future. Now, when we look at fear, I think fear can actually be a positive emotion because if you're leaving the known and going into the unknown, okay, so you're trying to advance trying to do a little better, known to the un, you're going to face fear. That's part of it. But see, fear is a good, good barometer. It's a good metric because it shows you that you're challenging yourself to be your very, very best. Because when you stay where you are, you don't really face a lot of fear. It's usually when you're moving forward, it's though, you know, it's that, uh, you know, match point, you know, in tennis or, you know, people can, can see the equivalent in all of their lives. Um, so it's separating the two. And that really comes down to language that we use. You know, how do we interpret events in our life? You know, oftentimes you hear people say, well, that's a catastrophe. Well, that's a pretty big word. Is it a catastrophe? Let's take a hard look at that. Most likely it's not. Maybe it's actually an inconvenience. Is it Mount Everest? Well, you know, actually, when you look at the facts, it's really a, a molehill. I just think that that's really, really important. We've seen that with COVID, right? Who people have, have absolutely gotten in this cycle of, of anxiety. And not to say COVID has been a, a huge challenge for all of us, without a doubt. But what we know from wisdom, as we look in our past, this too will end. You know, there's an old saying that goes like this. In times like these, it's important to remember there have been times like these. We're going to get through it. We're going to come out the other side a little bit better, more knowledgeable, more creative. I think we're going to have more gratitude. I love, I love that. I mean, and I want to, I want to talk with you a bit about my books, Roger, yeah. in, in the books, you know, because you definitely are somebody that goes beyond the lines. And I talk about creating not just a culture of excellence, but a superior culture of excellence. And that's what you've done. And I also talk about the difference between a victim mindset versus mm. a victor mindset. And sure. can, you, can you talk about, I mean, because obviously you have that victor mindset and, and it's a choice, right? We could choose to say, hey, woe is me and the world is falling apart or whatever, or we can choose to look at that one positive among 20 negatives, right? Absolutely. I, I really like how you put that, a victim and victor. I think that's really great. You know, something I say with audiences is this. One way that I'm absolutely certain that you can increase results is by decreasing excuses. Because when you remove excuses, right, when you remove that self-imposed limitation, it's amazing how these new possibilities emerge. I like what you said, Rusty, about all of us could say, woe is me. And I so agree with you because for everybody listening, we could all find an excuse to feel badly for ourselves. All of us can. However, when we are in a victim mentality, we feel completely out of control. Why? Because it's everyone else or circumstances doing this to us. We're not empowered at all. We've given up all of our power. We're a victim, right? But when you become a victor, when you have that victor mentality, you see that your thinking's volitional, your motivation is a choice, 
excellence is a choice. You know, I remember Rusty, I met somebody who had hands very similar to mine. And this was years ago. And I'll never forget during our conversation, it was evident that he was bitter and angry and he blamed all of his unhappiness, uh, his lack of success, his discontentment on his hands and his legs. And, and I remember I left that meeting really a changed person. I really was. Because here's the thought I had. If he was given normal hands and normal legs, in other words, his circumstances changed, but he had the same mindset, his life wouldn't be any different. He'd be at the same place in his life that he is today because we live life from the inside out. So that was a real epiphany for me meeting him. And that really put me on a quest to continue to study and to learn about, you know, what makes people successful? What makes them perform at their best? I love that, Roger. And Roger, you are a Hall of Fame speaker that have spoken to huge companies like Google, Microsoft, Apple, Nike, just to name a few. And when, when these companies have challenges, how, how are you able to help them? If you can give me an example of like a challenge they might have and, and how you would help them be, be better just to improve sure. themselves. Often organizations will, will ask me to come speak when they're going through change because change is also inevitable and change can be difficult. And the reason change is difficult is we really value as human beings, we value certainty. But the truth is, change is going to happen. So the question is, how do we respond to change? And something I share with, with organizations is the importance of a forward to normal mindset. In other words, not looking for everything to go back to normal, because it's not going back to normal. Normal is going to be ahead of us and not behind us. So a forward to normal mindset is letting go of that myth that we're going back to normal. It's being forward focused. It's, it's doing business as the world is today, but also doing business as the world's going to be. Now, nobody uh, can predict the future. Uh, you know, there's an old, you probably heard the saying, you know, I mean, it's easy to predict the future. It's hard to predict the future correctly. So we can't really predict the future, but we can prepare for the future. And one way we can prepare for the future is knowing and understanding that what brought us to where we are today is not gonna keep us where we are today. We have to continue and change and evolve. It's important that we don't let the change outside exceed the change inside. And I know, I understand that change can be difficult, but change is necessary. And here's why. Because the gift of change is, it provides us with new opportunities, new possibilities. And it helps us do more and be more. So I think change can be a great gift. Oftentimes we wanna resist it, pretend it's not happening and wanna go back to normal. The truth is we're not going back to normal. Your perspectives are absolutely perfect. Roger. And so when you're on stage in front of, let's say, 15,000 people, what, what are some key things that you do to really connect with the audience? Well, I really thank you for that question. I think that's a great one. And I, I, I'm not asked that very frequently, so I appreciate it. Um, so I had been speaking for like 10 years and I started to experience some anxiety. And what was happening, Rusty, was, um, you know, before my speech, my stomach would get upset, I'd start perspiring, and um, it was really, was really challenging for me. And, you know, once I got started, it was fine. I don't think the audience really knew, but I knew, right? And so I wanted to feel more at ease. Now, I'm always nervous, but I, I wanted to, to get, be released from that grips of anxiety. So I talked to a friend of mine. Here's what he said to me. He said, Roger, the issue is you're focusing on yourself and not the audience. And that was like an, uh, an epiphany. Again, I viewed that word before, but epiphany. I mean, this new awareness. And you know, Rusty, when I made that shift 
to stop thinking about me. You know, I'm thinking about, oh, you know, what if I perspire? What if I, and started focusing on the audience? The anxiety went away. Now, it's not to say that I'm not nervous. You know, when people ask me about that, they say, well, gosh, you know, you're probably over the nervousness. I said, no, not at all. I'm still nervous before I speak. Absolutely. But I, I'm not gripped by that anxiety. Yeah, no. And I think, you know, being nervous before speaking or before, a, you know, a, a sports competition or anything, it just shows that you care about what you're doing. I, I think I would tell my players I would be nervous if they weren't nervous before exactly. a big match. I agree. <laughs> and Roger, you know, for me as a coach, my my goal was really to develop the potential of greatness for each player on my team and as, as a team as a whole. And I want to ask you, how, how do you define greatness? Mm -hmm. Wonderful question. And I, and I would say this, Rusty, that as, as you look at your life, there are many dimensions of greatness. Okay. There's personal greatness, family greatness, you know, career greatness. And what I would say to people listening is this. I had someone ask me this question. What do you have written on your tombstone? And my response was, I'd rather be speaking. That's what I want on my tombstone. But as you think about what you'd want on your tombstone, I bet it would be something about contribution that you've made, that you've made a difference, that you've had impact. I really believe that that's a big part of greatness, because oftentimes we look at prominence, but prominence, it's all about us. And it's usually about something on the exterior. It's usually wealth or possessions. Thing is that, that that's fleeting. But when you think about significance, that's about others. And so what are you doing every day to invest in other people, inspire other people, uplift other people? Uh, I think that's a big part of greatness. You know, I think especially for young people today with social media, uh, you know, their definition of what they think success may be, I think in so many ways is an illusion, right? Um, and what I would also say is that I think everybody has greatness within them. I absolutely believe that. And it's taking a look at your life and saying, you know, where do I where do I really want to be great? Where do I really want to, where do I really want to excel? And that, that's, that's what I think of as greatness. You know, not everybody can be a Roger Federer, right? Not, you know, not everybody can be, you know, LeBron James. Not, not that those are not worthy goals, but if that is our metric, then we're going to be disappointed. You know, there's, but that doesn't mean that you don't have greatness doesn't mean that you don't have potential. You've got a tremendous amount of it. That's why I share with people that oftentimes we have to get out of, get out of our own way. We have to break through that limited thinking and start to say, well, you know, what's possible? You know, I often say this to audiences. I say, you know, I'm sure people have said to you that something that you want to attempt is impossible. I said, I think it's important to keep that in perspective. That's their opinion. That's not a fact. I love it. I love your insights, Roger. And, and Roger, I want to sincerely really thank you for taking time to be on the show today. I mean, you're an inspiration to me. And I, you, I love cool. that you're going to, the impact that you're having across the world. Well, listen, I appreciate uh, being on your show. And like I said, congratulations on all the great work you're doing and the great work that you've done in the past. And I was just thrilled to, uh, to be included today. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Roger. And thank you for watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. For more information, please visit RustyKomori.com. And my books are available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. I hope that Roger and I will inspire you to create your own superior culture of excellence and to find your greatness and help others find theirs. Aloha.